You're listening to the Be Better Off Show by Kelly Partners. Well, good morning to the Be Better Off Show where we get interesting Australian business people to share with us their stories and help us be healthier, wealthier and wiser. And this morning we've got Daniel Flynn, who's the co-founder and managing director of a company called Thank You. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning, Brett. Thank you for having me. Well, we should always start at the beginning because the beginning is a good place to start. And in your case, I've got, I, I have to ask, thank you. What does the company do and where did the name come from? Thank you exists all for the end of extreme poverty. We've set up a social enterprise. Uh, our business is owned 100% by our charitable trust. And that's, that's really unique. The whole idea behind thank you is that your purchase combined with everyone else's purchase uh, of thank you products can make a bigger impact. And we are really laser focused on funding initiatives that will help see the end of extreme poverty. Uh, The name, where did it come from? We think gratitude is, you know, it's one of the most powerful things um, in the world and we love it. And so to have a brand built around gratitude, thankfulness and saying thank you. We love the idea of it. Uh, when, when When we started, I just had this picture in my mind once of this word, thank you, full stop. And I was like, ah, could you call a brand or product thank you? I don't know. <laughs> uh, but, you know, people call their products Apple and some yep. other generic words and it kind of works. So we lent into it, but yeah, people love it and we do too. Great. And when did you start the business? So we started in 2008 and uh, in Melbourne, Australia, uh, we kicked off with our first product, which was water. Uh, water that funded water projects. We thought it was a really cool and controversial first product because bottled water, I mean, we always said it was a silly product, shouldn't exist, but consumers spent $50 billion on it annually uh, in 2008. Today, it's $140 billion. And we just had the idea of, well, imagine if the water that we buy could help bring water to people who need it. And 4,500 children die every day because of waterborne disease, which is just so wrong. And that was our, our kind of Genesis product. And it's now grown into over 50 products. Hand wash, perfectly placed behind me if anyone gets to see anything. But if you can only hear my voice, it's, uh, it, it's snuck in the background there. Uh, but yeah. So the biggest selling product today? Yeah, I'd say hand wash. Um, it, yeah. The Thank You Hand Wash has had the number one position in the supermarkets for about five years um, running. It's dipped down a little bit now and, and sort of goes up and down. But it, it is... Uh, uh, we sell a lot of hand wash, sanitizer, body wash, and super grateful to anyone uh, and everyone who's, who's, who's been part of this. Which is great. So explain, if you, if, you, if you would, please, if the business is owned by a charitable trust, hmm. how does that work and how did you come up with the idea? Yeah, I mean, we set out really on a mission first and the business became kind of second or, or, or the, the, the sort of the backing behind the mission. And the mission was we live in one world with two extremes. We see extreme poverty, which is 736 million people uh, who live in it, and we see extreme consumerism. And it, this blows my mind, but we spend $63 trillion as consumers every year. That's a lot of dollars, and we saw thank you as a bridge between those two extremes. And we felt early on that for thank you to be what we saw it to be, it needed to exist not part for, but all for its mission. And, and so for us, that, that meant that, you know, all the profits or the ownership would, would be for the mission. And, and, and so it kind of made sense to start a business. Business exists to kind of benefit the shareholders. We thought, great. Our shareholders, the Thank You Charitable Trust, you can own it 100%, and we'll work, out, work really hard to, to bring as much benefit to that as possible. Uh, it, it creates a super simple message for consumers. We can claim we exist all for our purpose. The challenge uh, does come in when you think of scaling business. We've had to tackle those yeah. problems other ways. And so today, when the business makes a profit or – that's owned by the charitable trust, what does it specifically support? So extreme poverty is complex. Um, it is the term given to people living on less than $1.90 a day globally. 
Uh, and, and so before the pandemic, there were 736 million people in that group. And that is now growing, unfortunately, for the first time in decades. Um, to solve it, it's not as simple as well, people need water, so let's get some wells. People need food. Let's drop some food off. Um, and, and a lot of the approaches over the years have, have looked like that. Um, but I think everyone listening now in 2021 understands that, uh, you know, when you have big problems, there are systemic issues and they're complicated. And so we fund partners, uh, 18 currently, but uh, across so many different facets and, and some look at mental health just to start there. I mean, if you're not mentally resilient, um, in fact, these guys are the first organization in Africa fully focused on this um, and they're focused on helping the 66 million women they estimate struggling with with mental health and you know that 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 like mental resilience to help lift your family out of poverty that's part of the story we have other organizations that work in microfinance and, and enterprise and so they're helping farmers make more money they're helping people start businesses we fund some groups who uh, like deep rise who back local change makers uh, who are starting social businesses or charities locally. We fund some really innovative partners in the water space uh, and, and agriculture and health. Uh, and so really we fund a lot of everything, but what we look for, the common thread is we are looking for partners who are pioneers, who are thinking about how do we create true impact and not just do lots of activity. They're thinking about the root cause and what is the systems change needed and how do we change that versus what's a quick outcome that might make a donor happy and sound good. And so a lot of the work we fund is actually quite expensive. Um, you know, we fund research. Uh, you know, research is not super popular in the funding world because you're sort of giving money to a piece of paper. But as we would know in, in areas like business and medicine, research is what advances. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and we have sort of a philanthropic sector that is a little bit in the dark ages in comparison to maybe medicine or business. business. And, and it's, it's in part because of what's been funded and what was really hard to get funding. Yeah, for. It's very, it's, it is very interesting because a lot of the psychology breakthroughs are coming from business research. But there's yeah. huge funding in the business space and and so projects that can't get funded in a social sciences sense are being funded through mm -hmm. you know a business lens, which is very, very interesting. So what is the level of funding now that the business contributes every year? Yeah, it's growing uh, and it goes up and down depending on lots of factors. But for context, so we we in 12 years raised seven million dollars for our partners. Um but, you know, it was probably year, year five, we were, uh, we'd raised about $500,000. So, you know, the organizations really started to pick up momentum and scale. Last year was a big year for us. We were able to give, on top of that $7 million, a further $10 million to our impact partners. And that's off the back of huge increase of sales in sanitizer and hand wash, um, you know, during 2020, 2021. So, yeah, I mean, the... <laughs> The more product we sell, uh, the more people that, that kind of make the, the switch, the more impact we can make. It's a simple model. Uh, some days I, I think uh, it's super hard to run, and that's in part because we operate in a very competitive consumer environment. And so yeah. sometimes people choose thank you. Maybe sometimes uh, they'll grab another product that's on special. Uh, and, and so, yeah, our funding literally follows that uh, very closely. The choices. So... What's the long-term vision? Is is it your view that the model has been tested in other businesses that are that where it's proved six, to be successful, or as you say, in your sort of FMCG space up against really well-capitalized businesses? Mm -hmm. do, do you have enough flexibility to structure the business in a way to be long-term competitive? Uh, look, I think I think innovation and you know that kind of infinite mindset. Simon Sinek talks about, well, has us set for long-term sustainability. You know, I think it's hard. I think it's challenging. The model is challenging, has challenges with it. We believe in it. So we'll keep, and we think, we think the shoe fits for thank you. 
Um, if I was sitting down with someone starting up, I would not say, here, you should, you should definitely wear these shoes. You could, but you'd need to be very comfortable going eyes wide open. Um, and, and, and I think find the shoe that fits for you. It does fit for us. And um, we are up against some, some pretty big organizations. They do have access to capital. Um, and, and, you know, some days I, I kind of wish, wish we were them. Um, but then other days I think they wish they were us. Um, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's, yeah, something that we've been thinking deeply about in, in many ways. There's a great quote that says, it's not the big that eat the small, it's the fast that eat the slow. And I, I think that for, for a lot of our journey, we have envied big and, and at, at the same time, maybe underestimated just the speed and the agility thank you's had. Yeah. Yeah. You know, last year was a great example. We won a whole bunch of huge tenders, um, you know, government work with sanitizers, retailer work, and uh, we won it, which blows my mind, uh, on, on price. Now, I mean, I, I'm very proud of thank you, but I sort of think we're kind of little compared to every other group out there. Um, one, one particular category manager uh, he said, hey, thank you so much, guys. Like, you're not price gouging. Yeah, Other yeah. people are offering me the same essential product, but for triple the price right now. So where, where are you manufacturing, Daniel? Uh, so the majority of our manufacturing is here in Australia. We, last year, Australian supply chain literally fell apart, certainly for us, um, in a big way. So we had to lead on some you know, overseas suppliers to help, which was mission critical. Um, and I think our overall view is, 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 I mean, I personally love Made in Australia, the concept, but I also acknowledge we are a global uh, market and a globally competitive market. And so I think we're open to manufacturing kind of anywhere. And so we've had some work uh, in China, uh, with some manufacturing of, of a great product actually out of New York, uh, Long Island, I couldn't believe it, uh, but very good product for very competitive on price. And we really look for innovation, strong quality product, and something that's going to stand out in the market. Yeah, it's interesting. And so in, in COVID, I, as you've raised, I, I've, I've been having this challenge with myself over the last six months to see if I can do interviews without mentioning COVID. Um, mm -hmm until the end, if at all. <laughs> but in your business, it has had you yeah. know, this real impact. What have, what have you seen as not, not so much the business impact, but do you see any sort of long-term lessons for the business and, and your people that have sort of come to the fore through that experience? Yeah. I mean, I think businesses go through cycles. I think we went from startup to uh, much more established um, and we kind of got to that point with all the systems, all the processes, all the people, um, all the departments and probably for the, for the business we were, it's about the shoe that fits for you. I think we, we became too slow and we became too structured. And so, you know, COVID has shown us the importance of agility, the importance of speed, the importance of, risk taking and you have to take significant risk if you want to see significant return and opportunity. And I think a lot of people want the return without the risk. They want the stability, which I think is a ultimate illusion. And, and that's what we all discovered last year is that, you know, the bubble of uh, stability, it can pop at any moment and, you know, last year was one thing, you know, but there have been many more, many more challenges. I mean, even right now, global supply chain has not settled down. It's become increasingly more complex. Shipping prices tripled, quadrupled. I mean, that is just, no one built their models for that. The, the, you know, there's a pallet shortage globally right now. That's sort of the latest, you know, twist of, and there's, there's, there's many. And so you can make your product, great job. Uh, you can have a customer who wants to buy it, but if you can't get that little piece of wood uh, that transports it, what happens? Big problem. Huge problem. Yeah, yep. huge problem. And so, like, I, I think, you know, we've gone back to our roots of maybe at times the scrappy startup 
I don't think we're scrappy, but I think that culture of MVP, you know, what is that sort of minimum viable product? How do we iterate? How do we, how do we get an idea out and improve later versus make the perfect idea, you know, and, and then push it out? I think that matters. I think teams have to be really mentally trained and ready um, to expect change to, I think one of the core competencies in, in sort of the future of business and, and it really draws on the past, but it's found in that grit and that stickability and also the ability to accept change quickly and see it positively and look for the positives in it. Now, I think we're all fatigued of change and I think we're all, you know, generally speaking, I feel like we've just, we've stuck at it long enough. But my gut feel is that the world is complicated and complex and, you know, I, I think we've probably got a next uh, pretty big decade ahead and, and beyond. And so how do we, how do we approach that? Do we approach it as victims and wishing the past or, um, you know, do, do we think like often that optimistic startup things? Anything's possible. We'll find a way. Um, let's do it together. Yeah, yeah it, it, I think it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. You know, is, is there more change than there has been in the past? In some respects, I think there is. Um, and a lot of businesses and, and individuals are, are being affected and, and not necessarily certain how to respond. But I, but I do think that in our lives at different times, we feel more, more capable of responding to it than at other times. So when you're, you know, young and you have no kids and you have no responsibilities and you haven't really got moving in life, if you like, yeah. um, it, I think you see often a, an easier path to deal with dramatic change. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think you see, you know, in the workforce, we see, you know, virtually the last taboo is ageism, you know, in that very few, even very modern corporations that talk about things like diversity have no um, quota or, or standards around employing people over 50 um, yeah. or people with disabilities or, yeah. you know, people that don't come from the same background or, or social situations as themselves. Yeah, it's, it, it is interesting, I think. I don't know that it's getting, getting more simple. It does seem to be becoming more, more complex. Yeah, I think, I think it is. And I think, I mean, one of the concepts in leadership and in business is around creating margin. You know, businesses spend a lot of time putting a lot of work into creating that financial margin to kind of make the world go around. But as leaders and individuals and workforces and family members, I don't think we've been as relentless in, you know, improving our margin. And so when the world hits or there's a crisis and it could be family, local, global, there's no margin. And so we break or we're broken. And, you know, I think, I think you know, and, and there is a, a hugely unhealthy culture in business of which thank you has been guilty, you know, as charged in, in kind of just pushing and pushing and working too much. And, you know, and, and it, it means that people don't have the margin they need to process change yeah, and to look, okay, how, how are we going to turn this around? And we got no margin. You just get into that defense mode. You, you shut down and lock down. So I kind of hope that we can, you know, as a culture, certainly as a, as a team, thank you, but I hope organizations can kind of wake up to how do we build more margin in for people? Um, because it's interesting because it's, soci- it's, it's society wide, you know, Governments didn't have enough ICU beds because funding ICU beds for a crisis doesn't seem like it's important unless there's a crisis. Yeah. Um, most people don't have a week's savings set aside. You know, there, there is no sort of supply chain resilience in major businesses has been, uh, that has been become pretty clear because there's an assumption everything will just continue as it, as it is. So risk management, as much as it's talked about, hasn't really been thought about. And then I think you're right. Like one of the things that's really... Um, struck me is that as people have sought to work from home, a lot of people haven't put themselves in accommodation that allows them to to work 
from home. And so, you know, or they have family situations that depend on two people working 80 hours a week, but you've got two kids and you've got to educate them and what happens if you have to educate them at home and if maybe there's only a small chance of that, but there's no, as you say, sort of margin of safety, if you like, as, as, as my friend Mr. Buffett would, would say. Um, but it's, you know, it's a good one to think about, you know, because yeah. I think well-run businesses and people and families are, are always thinking about sort of downside protection. Yeah, yeah, and it is. I mean, I find it hard personally from I've probably got an optimism bias, you know? So yeah. I'll just sort of, you know, say for a rainy day, it's raining right now where I am, but like it's like, oh, yeah, we'll figure it out on the rainy day. That's not a great approach. Um, you look at some pretty successful businesses. I'm not sure if, what the latest stockpile of cash is at Apple, but it was at one point, did you hear like $400 billion? Am I right? Oh, yeah, way more, nearly a trillion dollars. Okay, cool. Great. Sorry. Yeah, that's, that's how tough today I am on that one, right? But like that is a very different, like when you operate under that idea versus say a trillion dollars of debt or just debt in general or no surplus or no reserves, I, I think it's, it's just... It, it changes how you, you, you think and innovate, create. And yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think we've got to think more about that. And I'll tell you, that's very hard. Actually, just as I say that out loud, super hard for an organization like thank you because we're in the business of giving. And so people buy into this so that we give and that's exactly what we do. But uh, what about the reserves? What about when everything's disrupted and you could lose the business overnight? These are things we wrestle with. But the societal expectation would be like, you shouldn't be probably having too many reserves. Like certainly not. A, I mean, if it came out that think you had a trillion dollars cash in reserve, I think we'd all be pretty ticked off. Yeah, but in the con- I think in the context of a business, I think reserves are prudent, and I think they can be explained by in- they can be explained to engage stakeholders. Um, yeah, and you know, it's what our politicians do, and I think leaders do as well. Is they assume people won't understand rather than making the effort to have a conversation and explain. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it gets people sort of communicating in shorthand and talking down to people ultimately. But mm-hmm. if you grabbed your stakeholders and said, hey, we've been through this situation, we think we should have enough cash set aside that we can operate the business for 12 months in a calamity or a catastrophe, what do you guys think? I think any board of a charity or, or company would say, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Why don't we refill, <laughs> you know, the strategic reserves, if you like. But it's, you know, again, it's a conversation that takes forethought. It takes a lot of effort to communicate well, you know, and, and to yeah. engage people. But, you know, it's a, I, I think it's one of those big lessons that come from COVID, you know, this idea of what's the resilience of your people, yourself, your supply chain, the business, because one of the things, you know, I've always wanted to have a people team, not a human resources department, because I don't think humans are resources to be consumed by a business. But, you know, always at the top of my mind is, you know, how do we build in enough opportunity to, to allow our people to recharge and stay fresh? And yes, people should work hard. Life's like, like a gym, you know, if you go there and do nothing, you end up weak and soft. You also need to make sure that um, people, you know, feel like they have the capacity to, to learn and grow and, and get the recharge that comes from that. So it is, I think COVID's been a good time of reflection for people. People have had a bit more time, even, even though they've been busy, they're not so much tearing around in travel and other old patterns of behaviour that hadn't been examined, I think, for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and technology's probably made a difference. But to your point, you know, on your 736 million people that are in extreme poverty, and, and as you said, for the first time in more than a decade, that number is growing. I, I see no great structural effort to reduce consumerism generally. And so, and you see the impact of technology and education really delivering returns at exponential rates to those people that, that are engaged and can use technology and are educated. What, what's your sense of, you know, what that does to extreme poverty and my sense is that there's not a huge amount of awareness, let alone much care factor for the issue generally. Yeah, I would, I would say that's pretty spot on. Um, I think if you sat every person down and everyone listening, if we all took a moment to think about 
and, and for me at the very beginning, I was 19. We got kids now, Jesse and I, we didn't, you know, have kids. And when we started, we were dating, we were co-founders. It was an adventure. Um, Jared, we'd known each other from school. We were best mates and, but we were so moved because we stopped and really thought about it. And for me, it was this idea of, wow, imagine if I lost my sisters to waterborne disease because the water, I got them, killed them. That happens to four and a half thousand kids a day. At the time, 900 million people didn't have access to clean water. And I think if we all stopped for a moment and thought, right, imagine I'm holding my own child, my friend's child, they're, they're dying or dead because the, wa- the water like it just, and, and considering we like it's to, obscene, right? Like it is. Like, it is. It is. But what it does is, that say about our priorities, right? Like we're reading daily. I think the US this week appointed their first transgender general, mm-hmm. and that might be some sort of progress for you know someone somewhere. But it, these these issues that are large to small groups of people, and not to invalidate them, but when you've got seven hundred and thirty-six million people in extreme poverty and you've got four and a half thousand kids a day dying from waterborne disease, I personally struggle to see some issues that get an enormous amount of airtime in our overprivileged societies as being quite as critical as issues that are obviously critical but seem to be largely ignored. Yeah, and, and I mean, we've... We've locked onto this for 13 years now. And we, I mean, my personal perspective is deep down, everyone would care, particularly if you took the time, but we are. I think, I think not very deep down. Well, yeah, I, oh, that's a good call. Not, not very deep, just a little bit deeper. I don't reckon, um, I reckon if I had 10 people having a beer and you made yeah. that statement, you'd have 10 people agree within less than 10 seconds that that is an outrage. Yeah. And then, and their simple question would be, "What can I do that is yeah. easy? Yeah. Uh, you know, that could solve the problem." And sanit- sanitation of water, yeah. we've mastered for some time. The technology yeah. has made huge leaps. There are people around the world working on. I know the Gates Foundation are doing a lot in that space as well. Yeah, but it does feel to me like some of these enormous issues. <sighs> You know, people would be prepared to do a lot at a s- systemic level if if there was leadership that in, that was interested. Yeah, and and, and it's. Uh, I mean, I, I think about those ten people that you're sitting there and having a beer with. Uh, the, the statistics aren't great. Um, you know, once people and you know people have been doing ads about poverty forever, but I think in Australia they they reckon there is of the 24 million, about a million people that donate, um, or it might be just under to issues around poverty. Um, there are many things people donate to, but, you know, so, so that is. But it's very unseen in Australia, right? Like we don't have a whole bunch of people dying from unsanitized correct. water. Correct, yeah, correct. It correct. feels yeah. like an issue that's, that's a long way away. But I, I must say, like you see with COVID and all the rest of it, if the government said it, turned around tomorrow and said, because there's always the argument about offshore you know, support of offshore development generally and donations, but, hey, we're going to put your taxes up by 100 bucks a person and it's going to go with no friction directly to building dams or building clean water in and we'll do one country at a time. I, I feel like it would be more like a national rallying point than some sort of giant scandal. You know, if you could say that yeah. in this small country, yeah. sanitation is terrible and X number of kids are dying a day, yeah. And as Australians, we're just going to fix one country at a time. I can't imagine anyone being too upset about it. Well, it's a fascinating topic. Interestingly, humans are a bit more complicated because as a group, we are all very self-focused and tribal. So I think in Australia, the, the government has in fact dropped the contribution to international aid. Um, and- I think, which I think, I think makes sense because, you know, most people that go to work every day mm. don't appreciate sort of the works to greenism of the people that promote that particular giving to their friends in organisations that waste money. But those same people that might oppose that, I I can't imagine opposing, you know, friction-free support of 
an actual no. development outcome, right? It's, the NGO sort of sectors become so big and full of so many hangers on and appears to be so inefficient generally mm. that I think it's easy for people to say, why are we giving money to the UN, for example, right? Which does look like, you know, a bunch of people sitting around talking to each other. Mm. But when you see a village where there's something that needs to be done, mm. And there are charities that are quite successful by being so focused on genuine deliverables. Yeah, yeah. Look, it's I, I like your optimism. I'm not cynical about people. Right? No, no, no. Look, like, I think I'm people want to help, but they hate politicians. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, our job at Thank You, and this is where we've resolved, our job at Thank You is those that conversation with the 10 people having beer, um, I'd like to be able to tell them, hey, there's an issue. By the way, that beer you all drunk tonight was thank you. And yeah. I'm not saying we're getting into beer, but the concept is. No, but just, just you, buy some hand wash. Like, you've already, yeah, you've already, you've already made a difference. And if you want to make yeah. more of a difference, Do join us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's very cool. So what's your 10-year what's your plan, your 20-year plan? Like for you and you mentioned your wife, Justine. Yeah. Like is, how old are your kids now? Uh, so Jed is six and Jordan, okay. our daughter, is nine months old. So Okay. Really. So like the 10-year plan, the 20-year plan. Yeah. Is it stay nimble, keep innovating? Yeah. I mean, I can, I can give it to you loosely, you know. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the mission from day one was this is a story of, a, I suppose, a couple of people and a product that grew to uh, more products and more people that we see growing to more countries and then more products and then more people. And that the model is that. So you will see thank you popping up in more and more categories. We have a history in water, personal care, food, baby, like nappies and diapers. Um, you'll see thank you popping up in more categories. Um, once we get the product right and we're happy with it and we're convinced that it is in itself a market leader without the cause, you add that in, it's a game changer. Uh, and then you'll see thank you pop up in more countries. Um, and so just even in that sentence, there's a lot of work to be done because there's a lot of, a lot of countries that thank you is not yet in. And there is a lot of categories uh, yeah. that we're yet to find us in. So do you use public capital markets like the um, Sown Hearts and Minds conference? They've got a billion dollar listed investment vehicle. A hundred percent of the profits go to, you know, particular charities. Like I could see that you could, that you could really structure to allow people to invest, to want to support what you're doing, um, but really magnify what you're able to do. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we have some thinking around it. Um, we've had some really great people back this. Um, there, there is, yeah, different ways that people can support. I, I think the traditional investment isn't quite on the table, the equity piece, but outside of that, we're always looking for creative ways to, to grow and scale. It, why, why is that? Do you think that people wouldn't invest for something other than a financial return? I, I think uh, philanthropists and social investors who are actually social investors, not investors looking for the new term to sort of, um, it's, it sounds super cool. So that group wouldn't be interested um, and we wouldn't be interested in them. But people that are genuinely like, hey, we've got some money and that invested in the right way without yeah. changing the mission, without personally benefiting from that mission. I, I think that's a, it's a match made in heaven for the thank you model anyway. And I think you could get an allocation from those people who aren't, you know, who aren't purely investing for financial return. I think mm. it's really interesting. Mate, really great to chat. I'm really pleased for our audience to have heard from Daniel today and, and his company. Thank you. Him and Justine's company. Thank you. I think what you're doing is really amazing. Um, I think it, you know, it's a, it's a constant challenge to, to reimagine and rethink mm. um, ways of doing things. But, but ultimately, things don't change without people, you know, uh, coming up with, with different ways to do things. Um, and I think the, the, the impact that you're having through your product, but also through the way you're structuring and encouraging other people to think more broadly about their businesses is really great and likely to, likely to create uh, even more change than, than you probably suspect over time. Well, that's the goal. But, yeah, thank you so much, Brett. 
Great to connect. Really great. So as I like to say at the end of every interview, have a great day. Awesome. Thanks for listening to the Be Better Off show. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts. Have a great day.